Hi, my name is Martin Purnell, and welcome to Off Grid Christianity, a weekly podcast for those who go or don't go to church, and for those that are disillusioned. This podcast series is to encourage via conversation and not necessarily change your mind prior to listening. You can contact us as well by email ogc at accessradio.biz and check out our Facebook page, Off Grid Christianity. And we have our own website, offgridchristianity.co.uk. So please enjoy our special Christmas edition of Off Grid Christianity. Just like last year's episode, we hope to add some fun with answers to questions that might or might not be serious. However, those that are serious, the answers do not necessarily reflect what the others on this podcast actually believe or what their lawyers have instructed us to say. Our first guest is Noel Richards. Hi, Noel. Please give us a quick reminder as to who you are. Right. Uh, I'm Noel Richards. I'm a singer-songwriter. I live in the sunny climes of Mallorca in the Mediterranean. And that's about it, really. And our second guest is Martin Scott. Hi, Martin. Please give us a quick reminder as to who you are. Hey, great to be here. I'm Martin, Martin Scott. And uh, what can I say? Well, I live in Spain, but uh, I'm in the UK at the moment, so... Not quite as sunny as normal, but great to be here, guys. As it's a special festive podcast, just like last year, we're having a wee tipple or two. So what poisons have you chosen? No, what have you got, sir? Well, I've got uh, a red wine, which is from one of my favourite producers. It's called Coto de Imath, and it's a Rioja. I actually opened this uh, for lunch today because we had spaghetti bolognese for lunch, and you can't have spaghetti without red wine. No. So... Uh, I'm now on my sort of third glass as we do this podcast tonight. So if there's anything incoherent, it's the bottle. Yeah, and occasionally you might actually put some red wine into the bolognese as well. Uh, yes, but that would be sacrilege to use this very nice wine. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I'm tippling tonight. <laughs> All joking aside. Thank you. Martin? Uh, like Noel, it is a Rioja. And I bought this one because of the label. The label says Todo everything mm-hmm. or nada nothing or english i guess all or nothing yeah but the the nada part has a line through it so it's like you haven't got an option it's everything oh i like that oh i brought it to the uk to give to a few people and i've stolen a glass myself because i thought it's a time for a come on full-on commitment total how did you get that to the uk oh you drove didn't you you drove we drove as yes. we're here for a long time, and as the price of wine in the UK, it's not the same as Spain. Yeah. We actually came, I think, with 36 bottles. Hanging on the wall. That sounds wonderful. a lot. Yes. But we've been here 90 days. Mm, and excellent. and I, I've been drinking less red wine uh, in the last eight weeks because we've been visiting our family in the US. And wine is <laughs> so expensive Ooh, over there crazy, that we do actually limit our consumption. Yes, so I'm really enjoying being back home and having really good wines at That's sensible prices. And for me, I'm drinking, uh, I make my own beer, as you, as you know, so I'm, I've got my own stout to drink tonight. Nice mm. one. Very good. It's gorgeous. So thank you to everybody at Pinter. I wish they could sponsor me. <laughs> So that's what we're drinking. And whatever you're drinking at home, then please sit back and relax and enjoy, especially if you're feeling lonely and, you know, you need some laughter and maybe some brain stimulation as well. Talking of brain stimulation, it's the annual quiz. One last oh year. Oh, my word. The oh, Fizz Buzz Lord, quiz. Help us. Oh, great. So who's Fizz? Well, who would I to be Fizz? I'm easy. No, you can be Fizz. Martin, you can be Buzz then. I'm Fizz. Oh, yeah, Buzz and Fizz. Okay, I'm Buzz. Yeah, so you just have to say Buzz. And first person to Fizz or Buzz gets the chance to win. All right, here we go, here we go. I'm ready. Let's go. Here we go, question one then. What island was found by Richard Rowe on December 25th, 1643? An island, Easter mm. Island. Well, do you say fizz? Uh, you, you need to go fizz. Yeah, you got to say fizz or buzz. Oh, fizz. You lose points. No, Richards. I've changed my mind. It's Christmas Island. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because this is a Christmas show, and I'm sure there's an island called Christmas Island. It and, must be. Yes. And it was on December the 25th. They found it. There you yes. Go. 190 nautical miles south of Java and Sumatra, and 850 nautical miles northwest from the Australian mainland. Christmas Island found December 25th, oh. 1643. No, I'm takes, on a roll. Yeah. Easter Island. <laughs> <laughs> April Fool's Day Island. <laughs> no? All right. <laughs> Pretty close, no? I had a chance yeah. to think while well, I pressed my button. <laughs> yeah, I pressed your button. It's brilliant. Right. Okay, question number two. We let you off. 
We like you. Come on, number two. Buzz. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Premature. <laughs> okay. Which word associated with Christmas was first used in English in 1721? Buzz. Tree. No. Which word associated with Christmas was first used in English in 1721? Buzz. Martin. Buzz. Oh, Martin again. Oh, yeah. It's pudding. Christmas, Christmas pudding. Could be here a long time. No. no. Buzz. Uh, <laughs> Martin. Christmas cracker. <laughs> no, I'm sure that word was around beforehand. Buzz. Martin. Buzz. Christmas Easter Island. <laughs> fizz. Oh, no, please. Oh, fizz. Carol. Herald, did you say? I said Carol. Oh, Carol. That's a very good try. No, it's not. Then Herald. And Her- <laughs> it wasn't Herald either. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Shall I put you out your misery then? Please. Okay. Xmas. Really? Yeah. What? Xmas was used in English for the first time in 1721. You think that it's like a modern day loose translation yeah. of Christmas. No. Wow. No. X, of course, is the uh, Greek letter chi. C-H-I. I say pronounce it, is it? I didn't do Greek. Chi. Chi. Sorry, chi. Okay. And is the first letter of the Greek word Christos. So when people say, let's put Christ back into Christmas, they don't really understand that Xmas is actually theologically correct. Correct. Ah, you learn something new every day. There you go. Can I uh, make a little plea here? Please, Martin. Yes. And no, I'll I'll ask you whether you agree or not, but I did not feel the question was sufficiently clear. I thought it's what word was associated with Christmas. Yes. I would have got Xmas straight off. It it wasn't a word. It was a letter. No. (laughs) Which word associated with Christmas was first used in English in 1721? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that. If you had said something like, which word with four letters beginning with the letter X yeah. that stands as a substitute for Christmas, and the last part is it's like mass as in the Spanish more, yes, I might have okay. got that. You would have. You might have said Easter. Might I have might have got it. Might have you might have, might have said Easter, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So no points for that then. No, but you're you're oh, well in the lead though. No, you know you I'm well in the lead. Lead. harsh. Okay, they get better. Bring it on. Question three: A 2010 survey found six out of ten Americans do this at Christmas or Xmas, whilst a similar survey in 2015 showed 2.5 million people do this in the UK. What is it? Buzz. Oh, Martin. They attend a Christmas. Service. Correct, Amundo. Very good. They do. Oh, that was impressive. Yes, I have to say that was impressive. Well done, Thank Martin. Thank you. Yeah. How many points? Are... The same as Noel. That, that was more difficult. It's the same because he only had one chance at getting it right, whereas on the first question, Martin, we lost count. Point of order here. Did he yes. say buzz? <gasps> oh, he most certainly did. Replay, he replay. Did. I think he oh, did. We can't replay yeah. it, but I'll... No, I'll... yep, replay. I will listen to it afterwards. Question four. In 1223... Or 1,223 AD, Saint Francis of Assisi, although he would only be Francis of Assisi then, introduced the world to what Christmas tradition? Fizz. No, Richards. The Carol. No. Fizz. Oh, uh, no, Richards again. Christmas pudding. No. Could be here a long time. Buzz. Uh, buzz Martin. Buzz. Buzz. <laughs> Three times I buzzed. No, did you? Okay, not? I I know do that. Uh, being Italian. Yes. Prosecco. <laughs> this is getting more work. This is getting more absurd. Yes. No. It's a great no. answer. No. Thank you. Prosecco is a Christmas tradition now, isn't it? But I think that's mainly because it's cheaper than champagne. That's my logic behind it. A point of order, Brother Francis was all for the poor. Mm-hmm. Prosecco ah. is cheaper. Fizz. It is cheaper. Yes. No. Giving money to the poor. No. Okay. Buzz, I gave him a clue. I need a point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, where do we go? These are fascinating facts. No, I give up. No, I haven't a clue. Not a clue. Well, in 1223, if we go back in my time machine that I bought off on eBay, <laughs> he introduced the world to the first nativity scene in the church, or just outside the church. Good. That is interesting, yes. You, uh, they only get better. We've got two questions left, and this is a pulsating match. Uh, what's the score, please, Martin? Because I know you like to keep score. Oh. I think it's one each, isn't it? It's one each here. Yeah. Question five. And the sixth one. Can I just say I love it? Question five. What are the three traditional colours in Christmas and what do they symbolise? In fact, I'll be more specific. What are the three traditional colours in Christmas decorating? Piss. Buzz. No, Richards. 
Red, green and white. Buzz. Oh, I'll pass it over to Martin. Red, green and silver. I got red and green. Then I get you two did. points for that. Ah. Uh... Okay. I gave him a clue, though, when I said red and green. Well, you did. But it doesn't mean that it was right. <laughs> ah. Wrong. You were right, Noel, with your what? Red... two of three. Red, green and white. Two of the three you were right with. And? And Martin, you were right with two of the three as well. That's right. Red is the colour of Santa Claus's outfit. Green <laughs> is the colour of uh, holly. And silver. It's not silver. Not silver. Gold. Oh. And white is the wrong answer. Oh, gosh. Okay. Gold. I'm just trying to be clever here. Who said gold? Yeah. Did you buzz or fizz? I, no, I, he didn't. He didn't. Buzz is correct. Gold. So it's red, green and gold. So what does gold signify? Well, it's the gift that was brought for Jesus. One of the three gifts of the Magi, yes. Red is actually to signify the blood of the crucifixion, not Santa Claus's wow. outfit, which was kind of given to the world by Coca-Cola. And the green? Uh, Symbolises eternal life, like the holly and evergreen trees. No, what's the score, please? You can make it equal. Let's have a deciding question, a deciding question. 12, 12 all. <laughs> yeah, OK, 12 all. I'll go for that. Yeah, 12 all. Extra time. Here, Here we, we go. go. What happened for the last time on Christmas Day in Blackpool in 1965? Buzz. Oh, Martin Scott. They either switched the lights on or... <laughs> There's no riches. They turned oh. them off. <laughs> they turned them off. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing to do with that. Buzz. Martin Scott. Christmas tree. They erected a Christmas tree in front of a very special building. No. Monumental building. No. Fizz. Uh, no. Ken Dodd did a carol concert. In Blackpool for the last time in 1965. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> it's, it's not right. I will now give you a further clue on this one. All right? Okay. Okay. It happened for the last time in Scotland, where we know someone is from, in 1976 in Clydebank, of all places, and the last time in Buzz. Blackpool in 1965, Buzz. Martin Scott. Buzz. They played football with someone's skull. <laughs> Do you know, if he just said they played football, he would have got it right. There you go. It was the last time a professional football match was played in England oh, between Blackpool and Blackburn. Uh, Blackpool won 4-2. And in 1976, Clyde Bank versus St Mirren. And they drew 2 all. OK. And Tony Fitzpatrick was playing for the, uh, St Mirren, who then we bought him in 1978 to play in our team. There you go. <laughs> there you go. OK. A draw. OK, a draw. Fair enough. We'll take a draw. Yep. <sighs> Moving on. Let's see if we can get better answers now, then. OK. Oh, come on. <laughs> the first question, kindly sent in by Noel, fun enough, uh, what do you think now, all these years later, of David Pawson's comment that God hates Christmas? Discuss. Who's going to go for that first? Since I uh, yeah, raised the on, question, no. it's, it's funny because you, you change as the years go on. But I remember being in the event at uh, a place called Guildford Civic Hall. Mm -hmm. We had a, a Christmas celebration event. And the late Gerald Coates was hosting and interviewing David Pawson. And he came out with this phrase that... You know, as far as he was concerned, God hates Christmas. And I think the initial reaction from a lot of people in the, the audience, there's probably about a thousand there, was bar humbug. You know, David Pawson uh, is a bit of a Scrooge. And I, I, I saw, saw it as quite a negative statement to make. But in hindsight, all these years later, I realized probably that David was speaking more truth than we realized at the time. So that's why I posed the question. I'm glad you did. So what's your thoughts on it then, Noel? Yeah, I think the idea that God looks down at, at all of us uh, in this time of great overconsumption, where we, we spend money that we don't have, get into debt uh, in order to buy some of these gifts, get under so much pressure to have uh, fun at Christmas, to have all sorts of crazy customs. I was just watching something on television before doing this podcast, about the elf on the shelf, which uh, is something that originated in a book in America in 2005. Now, everywhere you go, people are sticking toy elves on the shelves and 
communicating to their kids that the elf is watching you from Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve to make sure you behave, otherwise you won't get any gifts. And that's about as far removed from Christianity as I can imagine. Um, <laughs> so I think I, I love the idea of a winter festival and I love the idea of giving gifts. But to actually say that, you know, the modern day Christmas has got anything to do with what happened 2000 years ago in the Middle East, I think is, uh, yeah, it's a long way from that. You know, well, let's ask our resident theologian then, Martin, <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think if we push Noel and if we could push the late David, I think they would kind of nuance it a little. There are some mm. great aspects to Christmas that God loves. I think he really enjoys a bit of fun enjoys it when we enjoy life uh -huh. and i think probably he somehow manages to hate might be well it probably is the right word hate elements and love elements so i, I want to go down the middle well i understand where hate you're coming elements from, and love parts of it hmm. i think that's god yes the, the key he will find what he or she can enjoy with us and enter in and then look at this stupidity tied around money and elf on a shelf, as you say. And, uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Be, no, yes yes and no. Yeah, yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. David Pawson, then, obviously, he's no longer with us. How much of that comment was just to provoke and be, you know, thran or whatever word you want to use to wind people up? I wonder sometimes if that's the nature of people who have a sort of a, in quotes, prophetic bent, that they do actually cause us to pause and think, yeah, think and say, what do I really think? Maybe it's not to give us answers, but to actually cause us to ask questions ourselves. Yeah, maybe that's what he was doing. Martin? I, I guess it's a, it's provocation, isn't it? Mm. You get it in uh, the Old Testament. I hate your festivals. I hate your uh, sacrifices. Mm. And uh, I guess that was pretty provocative. Well, it wasn't our idea. I think you, you told us about them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, provocative. So I think God's a bit of a provoker. So basically, you think David most probably would say, well, yes, I was just provoking comment. He doesn't actually think that uh, God hates Christmas. He probably did, I think, but I can't <laughs> speak on his behalf. But I think the, the motivation would be to provoke. Yeah. Yes. I think it's good for us to be provoked. Why not? Now, why should we be provoked? Why is that good, do you think? Otherwise, we just carry on in the same way without yeah. actually thinking about what we're doing. So I think it's good to challenge ourselves about the things that we say, think, do, whatever. Some of our traditions as well, some of our culture. I think it's good to question some of those things. It's not unhelpful to do so. Which leads on, I suppose, in some ways. You hear the occasional, he wasn't angry, he was righteous anger. And who are you applying that to? People in the past. I mean... You know, you, you do hear from time to time when someone in church gets really, really angry or irate. No? You hear that? Yeah, I think um, we hear that. And I, I under, understand that. But I think anger can also be a big cover for something. I really hate da 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 But it's often a cover for something under, underneath it going on. The scripture says that uh, our anger does not work. God's anger uh, does not outwork it. And... Uh, also, I think we can, we're very quick to take our human emotion and say, God's bigger than us, but it's the same emotion. Mm. And I'm not sure that God's anger is quite my anger multiplied. Mm. I think it's a, a lot smarter than mine. No, but I think as well, if we say that God's angry with something, it's very difficult to argue yeah. with that. Yeah. You know, when, when somebody says, thus says the Lord. <laughs> I am angry. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I am angry over Christmas, I hate Christmas, then you can't really argue with that because that's somebody who claims to be speaking on behalf of God. Yeah. Which I would say is taking the Lord's name in vain. Mm. That's my understanding of that particular scripture. When we claim to speak on behalf of God, when God's going, hey, I don't feel like that. I quite like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, something you said there, Martin, took me back to my training days when I used to train people how to interview and sell properly and stuff like that. And when it came to objection handling, normally the first comments, yeah. you know, when you say, well, should go ahead, give me your, all your money. Do you want to go ahead with it? Normally the first objection comes back is actually not the true objection. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you then have to find out what the real objection is. Same sort of thing. Thank you. Well, the next question was from yourself, Martin. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> because uh, you have to do some explaining on this. Is capitalism bowing at the feet of Moloch? <laughs> Moloch is either something you eat. Yeah. So please explain. 
or you add to your beer brewing recipe. <laughs> yeah. Who well, is that's it. For, for the sake yeah, of who, those who are listening, who is Moloch? I know. <laughs> yeah. He is a, a god, a god in the Old Testament. You offered your uh, firstborn to Moloch, child sacrifice. And that was a pagan god, obviously. A pagan god. <laughs> Very Just much. clarifying that, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, it's, it's a bit of an overstatement, but I think, well, what's the question again that I, I wrote in? Is, <laughs> <laughs> is capitalism bowing oh, capitalism. Yeah, at yeah. the foot or feet of Moloch? Yeah, at some level. Because what what is Moloch? It is you sacrifice tomorrow so that you have a good today. How can we guarantee you the crops will come now? Well, right. the ultimate is you will sacrifice the next generation to Moloch, child sacrifice. Now, he, the god is happy. Uh -huh. Down comes the rain, the, the sun. We have a bumper harvest. And there's something of that in capitalism. I'm a little biased here, of course. But um, for me, the economy of scripture is you sow and you reap. Mm -hmm. There will always be seed time and harvest. We, we work yep. today for tomorrow, but that gets reversed where I borrow from tomorrow. I borrow from what does not yet exist for today. So, so Martin, yeah. um, what, what do you see that we're borrowing uh, at the moment does not yet exist? What are we borrowing? In um, simple terms, money. Uh huh. It's like we've heard in the, the press of the past year. People say, I'm not leaving any money in the world to my children because I'm going to spend it myself. Yeah. I've worked hard, so I'm going to spend it on myself and yeah. go to these luxury holidays and everything else like that. That'd be bang. Oh, I suppose a modern day equivalent yeah. of bang at the feet. I mean, the, the whole monetary system is based on debt. Yeah. Every country has debt. The one thing that they do not want to happen is we take all our money out of the bank. There is no debt. Everything collapses. So we have moved a long way, and I think it, it's just a sign we are willing to sacrifice. Take climate. Mm, exactly, yeah. You know, why can't we do something? But we know the result will be in 50, 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time, uninhabitable for our kids, grandkids. But yeah. for today, for today's prosperity, we, we sacrifice that. Yeah, and you've got a, a potential future president of the U.S. saying, you know, my first action will be drill, drill, drill. Exactly. Nothing wrong with marching, getting people fit. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. We will get oil, oil, oil. We will yeah. forget about the future of our children and our grandchildren, yeah. whatever world they will inherit, because yeah. we want it now. It's interesting you bring up the, the weather and the climate, because I do know people, really committed Christians, really yeah. intelligent people who say, no, it's rubbish what they're talking about at the moment. Nick's say from the other side, all the facts are coming out with, it's like Procrustes analysis. They're just taking what they want to make it sound really, really bad. And if you look at my figures, you can see that it's just that the earth does this every hundred or so years. I am no scientist, but you only have to look at what comes out the exhaust of every car. If I am pumping something into your body that is toxic, you will become very, very sick. So to me, it's a no-brainer. But I think there, for me, the, you know, the weight of evidence from the scientific community, is, it is stacked up. Now, I haven't got the ability to say, oh, that's wrong or that's what, but that's what, that's what they're coming out with. Uh, but I think what it, my point is, even if it were not true, where is the heart to make the planet a better place, not for us, but for the next lot that are coming along? Exactly. Yeah. So for me, that, that there is an element which, because obviously, where, where do Christians go when we talk about Moloch? Mm -hmm. They go straight to, and rightly so, abortion, child sacrifice. But I think if we could look much bigger, that's just one element. Why does abortion take place? Sometimes medical reasons, I understand that. But often economic reasons. It will mm. disturb my life. So to me, it's the same thing. Uh, and I think we need to be a little more critical than simply you know, a single issue, mm -hmm. abortion, yeah. and I'll vote for that. No, yeah. I, it's a much bigger, bigger picture. Yeah, I sometimes feel that we are losing our perspective on what is going on in the world right now and the things that do need addressing if we're going to be yeah. truly our stewards for the next generation. You know, we, yeah. we only live here for a while. 
And what will our grandchildren inherit? What will we leave them? And I think that is a very serious thing. Very, I'm glad you brought it up, Martin, because it is such an important issue. And I think when you look at oftentimes what Christians talk about and, and get excited about big meetings and 100,000 yeah. people meeting for worship, and I'm going, yeah, but mm -hmm. we don't need more of that. We actually need more people getting proactive in the issues that this world is really facing. Yeah. But then if you have an end times theology that it's all going to burn anyway, yeah. then you don't do anything about it. Yeah, we, we enjoy it while we have it because it's going to go. Yeah, exactly. We're talking about end times because it, it doesn't ever go away, does it? Once mm. you, you be a Christian, especially you, you're in church, there'll always be somebody coming up to you saying, oh, you know, we're in, living in the last days. You know, Jesus is coming really soon. And I really upset a, a lady once in a Bible bookshop in Bristol. And she said, don't you, want, don't you want to see Jesus come back? I said, no. She said, what is there to live for? Why do you want to come back? I said, well, I want to see Bristol City in the FA Cup final for a start. And, you know, 30 years on, I'm still waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's profound. Yeah. <laughs> what a hope you have. Thank you. It was either profound or stupid. You know, Scripture says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. Martin, I commend you. Oh, thank you. I think as Noel says, that, that whole eschatology is just uh it yeah to me it, it it is well we could do a whole podcast yeah which it's not really what? christmas related is it? <laughs> it it's not it's not it's not yeah i have no time for that no no time whatsoever well you know our, our dear departed friend gerald coates when i used to travel with him he would always say you know jesus is not coming back today And he said, if you disagree with me, let's talk about it over breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that would be my perspective. He ain't coming back today. Yeah. And if anybody listening to this podcast has an issue with that, just send me an email Yeah, tomorrow. the next day. But, but I, I think the bigger picture is whether today, tomorrow, or a thousand years time, it, it is this belief that this earth is just to be used and abused. Yeah. And we have the right to do that. And it's all going to burn up. There is not and I'll throw this out without um, qualification, there is no verse in Scripture that says it will all burn up. Now, for the clever people, they're going to come back to me with 2 Peter chapter 3, but I say, oh, I'll go read the chapter in context. That's read great. Again. And he's been to Another Theological Another podcast College. one day. He has been to Theological yeah. College, yeah. So he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, maybe. He does. It's when he says 3P to chapter 2. What theological college did you go to then? I, I said 2P to chapter 3. You did. I said, yeah, it's when you say that. Really. Ah, when oh, you say I that. See. Ah, I see. Yes. Well, back to theological college day, we had uh, a certain professor, uh, Donald Guthrie, who wrote two huge volumes in the New Testament. He was going through book by book. So he, he, uh, he got through one and two, Peter. So he was moving on from there. And uh, 15 minutes in, one that shall not be named Noel, but you do know him as a future, or he's now past, General Secretary of the Evangelical Alliance. Okay, yes. <laughs> Writing Put his name down up. and putting it up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Does it rhyme with bowl? No. Oh. Put his no. hand up and said, Professor, Why have you jumped three, Peter? To which did he really? He did. The erudite professor said, I wasn't aware that Brother Peter wrote us a third letter in the New Testament and moved on. <laughs> there you go. Ah. So there you go. Three, Peter. Three, Peter. I'm just going through all the former uh, Evangelical Alliance bigwigs. I will tell you afterwards. Uh, here's a question from Mrs. Trellis in North Wales. Should we be... Should we cre Is that a real person? <laughs> You're making this up? Oh. No, no. I was just trying no. to make it sound as if we had quite a few people writing in. Ah. If you listen to uh, I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, <laughs> you always get a letter from a Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. Oh, like Ang okay. Mr. Angry of Tunbridge Wells. Yes. And it was yes. Always, it's always Mrs. Trellis of, uh, ah. of North Wales. So This was a little joke. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it. I can say, well, we've got another question here from Noel. Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's hear the question from Mrs. Trellis then. Thank you. Yes. Should we Christians be countercultural at this season to bring back the true meaning Ooh. of Christmas? And what would it be? Mrs. Trellis, thank you for that question. <laughs> hmm. I think it's over to you, Noel. Countercultural. Yeah. Actually, you know, uh, yeah, I do quite enjoy this particular season. Went out and bought a Christmas tree yesterday. Oh, countercultural. Not at all. Uh, yeah. 
I thought it's about time we had a, a real little tree. I like the smell of pines and stuff like that and, and, mm. and lights on the tree and all that sort of stuff. So we got one. It's about 18 inches high. Nice. So it's a, it's a junior tree and we're going to maybe plant it afterwards and see what happens to it and maybe dig it up next year. More like an elf tree, I would say. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like an elf on the shelf. Counterculture. Hmm. I mean, what is the true meaning of Christmas anyway? Let's strip it down to the bare basics then. What is the true meaning of Christmas? Martin, you went to theological college. They must have talked about this. I, I did, long long time ago. I'm sure they did. It's got to be good news, isn't it? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and then goes on to his birth. So good news has got to be the heart of it. So a little bit of fun and fair and and then a bit of what we would call God thrown into it. Good news, the gospel uh, has got to be part of it. I, I think countercultural, yeah, we should be countercultural. You know, with our values, mm. and I think here's the challenge: how how are we counterculture? What's different between me and my neighbours in terms of our values? You know, what makes me tick? What my hopes are? Yeah. And um, at the same time, we've got to be culturally relevant. You know, my kids are grown up, but if you have kids and you say, "Oh, Christmas is commercialised. We're not going to celebrate it. No Christmas presents for you. We are countercultural." and no Christmas tree and no Christmas crackers and there's no turkey coming home here. Well, what are you doing? You're sacrificing them for the sake of your values, supposed mm. values. Or, or to me, that is, that is evil. Uh, and I think sometimes more fundamentalist um, Christians can do that to their kids. Mm. So to me, it's like we've got to be in the culture, but also I think a few areas where, that, that where we jar with the culture and show a different way. But it should be good news for showing, not not like you're enjoying yourselves and we don't. How yeah. cu- countercultural we are. No, you're a misery. Yeah, you are Mr. Humbug. Angry of Tunbridge Wells. Yeah, that would be my take on it. What, what yeah. You? yeah, I think we covered it in, in that first question I, I raised. You know, I think God likes some parts of it and God doesn't like the other parts. So it's finding the parts that God likes. It's actually being positive in the things that we communicate, not negative. I think that's the thing. I mean, Christians can be so negative at times yeah. for the sake of, well, we are different. We are, we're making a difference. Yeah. I was just thinking about Thanksgiving because I was in the US for Thanksgiving. And I, th- I think that having a day where we actually sit down as a family and we give thanks for what we have, I think the roots of that are fantastic. Yeah. And you know, to actually sit around and say, well, what, what are we giving thanks for? And so I think it's a great opportunity for a family to sit around the table together Christmas time, if we have a family unit, and actually reflect on the year that we have, take time to be kind to one another, bless each other. We may not be able to give much in the way of gifts, but there's things, our words can be so important. It's not about how much we spend, it's um, yeah. the quality of what we give to people. So I think that's important as well. And I think we as believers can so often be against something, Mm. um, anti-abortion. And I know now, and it's better, we use the term pro-life. But come on, Christmas time, we can be a little provocative. Pro-life, then you tie it to their eschatology and they're happy for Palestinians and Jews to kill each other because it's all fulfilling end times prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that a thing at the moment in eschatology? Uh, I think you will find that uh, Mr. Netanyahu, which I don't expect he listens to this, who, as I understand it, is not an active Jew by faith, but by race. He is happy to quote Deuteronomy. you got to wipe out all the Amalekites. And where do the Amalekites live? Mm, Amalekite land. In Gaza Strip. Yeah. So he can quote that. And I think there are, there are Christians who say this is all part of the end times, you yeah. know, and are probably re- rejoicing. Hey, we can see the signs of the times. Yeah, one of and the they'll things, call many of them pro-life. Yeah. You know, I read an article in the paper the other day, you know, where is the Me Too movement when uh, all these Israeli women are being raped by Hamas terrorists? Yeah. And it's okay. Well, they can be raped because they're evil Jews. And Hamas yeah. have been oppressed for so long. So, yes, women's rights don't count. So we're very flexible, very in, flexible. In, in our interpretation sometimes of what we hold dear. I, I was disappointed when all this kicked off back in October by the amount of 
Jewish flags, Israeli flags, that were being posted by Christians on Facebook. You yeah. know, and I, I posted an Israeli flag and a Palestinian flag. And I said, don't forget, yeah, you know, good. we have Christians, Christian brothers and sisters who live in Palestine. And, yeah. uh, you know, let's not forget that. Uh, and as fact, the Palestinians are Semitic as well. So, you know, we lose sight of that when we say, oh, well, we've got a side with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know that was a later question in the program, but obviously it's it's a very current issue right now. And I think yeah. we need to talk about it. Well, our, our son, only this week at work, said to one of his uh, co-workers, you, know, you went and studied politics or whatever it was at university. So what do you think, you know, about the Palestine uh, Israeli issue at the moment mm -hmm. and uh, she came back with well it's not as simple as that mm -hmm. and I thought that was that was a good answer to start off with because obviously I said well, what do you mean and she said well this doesn't just go back to October no. or like, the month before that no no you can't just sort of say oh it's it's this yeah it's a history that we living in a fair country of the United Kingdom we're not really aware of just how no. bad it has been on both yeah, sides yeah. exactly yeah Exactly. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It's awful when you get an evangelical perspective, which is, ah, well, this is another sign that God's coming yeah. back and bringing out all these scriptures. So those things are not, for me, not particularly helpful. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Trellis North Wales, for sending in that question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mrs. Trellis. Well, it seems that her husband has sent one in. Mr. Trellis ah, has whoa. come in. With uh, from where North Wales, they're still oh, married. North Wales, also, oh, yeah, they are together. That's yeah, this is brilliant. Isn't it? Bring it on. That's... What are the parallels of Caesar and Jesus and Roman imperialism? Yeah, well, that's a brilliant question. Thank you for that. I haven't got a clue what you're on about. <laughs> <laughs> could you repeat that? I could. What are the parallels of Caesar and Jesus and Roman imperialism regarding Christmas? I presume. Shall we have a go at that? Yes, go for it, Martin. Okay. Please. I should kick you off. There are so many parallels. Well, let me jump forward for a moment. When Paul preached, what did people hear? Okay. Uh, Rhetorical okay. question, which I shall try to unfold. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it wasn't a, a starter for five. So they did not understand, hmm, he's preaching about another God. He's asking me to put my hand up. He's got a prayer for me to say. Now I shall meet over here and raise my hands or read from a prayer book or whatever. They said, this geezer is talking about another king other than Caesar. So they instantly heard, dare I say it, a political speech. And not just a political speech. It would be like going to Russia, making a name for yourself and proclaiming a new president for Russia. How long would you last in that context? Yeah, wouldn't Not recommend very it. Long. No. And Paul was imprisoned many times for that reason, because it was heard to be political. And it was. I mean, you can look this up, for instance, Wikipedia. There is um, a calendar or a calendar inscription from 9 BC. It begins like this. The beginning of the gospel of Augustus Caesar that came into being through him. Mark 1 says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Caesar is king of kings. He is lord of lords. These are his titles. Christmas story. The angels come and say, peace on earth, goodwill to one and all. But Mr. Bossman in Rome says, we bring peace peace we, we've been through school we know it's called the pax romana mm. the peace of rome now I'll, I'll stop with this the irony of that is the temple to the god of peace in rome was built on the field dedicated to the god of war it's built on mars field okay how do they bring peace you submit or i kill you yes what does paul say he brought peace through his blood so you see all the parallels and all the contrasts. The parallels are everywhere. The word gospel, like I quoted from that, that calendar inscription, the beginning of the gospel mm. of Augustus Caesar. Every Caesar who came to the throne, the announcement was, this is the gospel. And every Caesar who had died became divine. 
So this is the gospel of Tiberius or Augustus, son of the divine Caesar, the one who died before. Mm. So Paul writes to Romans and says, I think he put it all wrong in Rome. God declared Jesus, son of God, by his resurrection. So I think you, you see a lot there. So I think we also now have to think for ourselves, where does the gospel challenge not, hey, you're a very bad person, you're a sinner, I've got this prayer, come to the front, I pray for you, you now I've got your ticket, you're, you're okay. Where does it challenge the powers, the political powers, the economic powers? Because I think that's what Paul was doing. And of course... End, end of rant. Yeah, no, that's very good, Martin. Good that's start. very good, Martin. Good start of there. And of course, Jesus talked about you need to be born again. And I thought about that recently, that basically when Jesus was saying you need to be born again, you know, you've been born as a citizen of Rome or a citizen of Israel, but you need to be born again into the kingdom yep. of heaven. And of course, when you are born into that kingdom, you become a citizen yep. of heaven. Your allegiance is to heaven. Yep. Your allegiance is not to a world system. So it's very difficult for me to give my allegiance to a country because as a Christian, my allegiance is to a higher kingdom and to a higher authority and to a greater king than King Charles, for example, mm. since I'm a Brit. So I do not bow to him because I only bow the knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Ah, now, if this was maybe Germany in the 1930s and 40s yeah. or whatever, or if I was a real horrible toe rag of a person, I could edit out the rest and say, listen to what Noel Rush has just said. He refuses to bow the knee to King Charles. And we do hear this as well, where people say, I'm not going to pay my taxes anymore because... Every so often you hear it and somebody goes to court because they're not doing it because they believe as a Christian shouldn't do it. But that's not what you're really saying, is it now? Or is it? No, not, no, I'm not saying that. No, I'm saying I'm a citizen of a different kingdom. So I'm not a patriot. So I, I, I can't be patriotic about my country because I belong to another country. I belong to another kingdom. I've been born, if I've been born again into the yeah. kingdom of heaven, my allegiance is to that king and his kingdom. And actually... Being in that kingdom means I do live in a responsible way, hopefully. So I do actually obey the law. I do pay my taxes. I do all those things because that is what I should be doing. But yeah. in terms of spiritual authority, uh, and that's why I guess you know, the early Christians went to the arenas and were put to death mm -hmm. because they wouldn't bow the knee and say Caesar is Lord. Because mm -hmm. yeah. no, Jesus is Lord. We sing it. We have songs. Jesus is Lord. We sing that all the time, but it's just a nice song. Yeah. Because in the West, we, yeah. we, don't, we don't actually have that challenged. Because it, it, it's private. That's your faith, Noel. It's over here. Yeah. Yes. But for those in the Roman Empire, mm. it's public. Say yeah. Caesar is Lord or yeah. we will kill you. Yes. So if you hadn't been born with two left feet, Noel, you could have been probably the greatest footballer of your generation to play for <laughs> Wales, <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> Alongside Gareth. Wales, almost, yeah, right, yeah. No, I, it would have been... Oh, you're saying he's me, really. Ryan. He, he'd well, be alongside Ryan. The truth is I would not have played football, in fact, because football in the culture in which I grew up uh, ah. was actually worldly. Everything that I now enjoy was worldly. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah, going to the cinema, watching television on Sunday, playing football, going to football matches going to a pub, going to the cinema, uh, the list is That's endless. Twice. That's twice you've gone to the cinema. Twice I've gone to the cinema. Anyway, so I escaped Wales and escaped a very narrow religious yeah. upbringing. And again, that's not a negative comment about my parents because no. my parents are wonderful. But I think yeah. we were in a very, yeah. Um, yeah. a very religious setup. And, uh, you know, our parents always do the best they can, but... There's so much we have to unlearn, you know. I was doing a coffee bar once in a church in the Rhondda Valley, Porth Elim Church. I was 17 at the time. And we used to do these coffee bars to get kids in off the street. Mm -hmm. And we'd put colored lights in and all that sort of thing. And I remember this uh, deacon come running in and shouting at us. He was going ape, you know. And he was uh, just about to have a heart attack. And he was really offended that we put a red light outside the church door. 
because we might attract the wrong kind of people. Barbers. <laughs> or the right kind of people. Marvellous, isn't it? Yes. And I thought, maybe that's the kind of people we want to attract. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cut above the rest. There you go. Anyway, I, don't know how digre <laughs> I digressed into that. But no, uh, yes, I could never have played football for Wales. Do you know, I've only ever been to one football soccer game in my life because we weren't allowed to go to soccer games. So I, I, don't have an, I don't have any sort of appetite to go to watch soccer. The only reason I mentioned that, Noel, was to come back to your patriotism sort of thing. Mm. That, you know, so yeah. I've been slightly facetious by saying you were born with two left feet. Otherwise, you would have been playing with Gareth and, and everybody else. Would you have worn the shirt, bearing in mind what you're saying about, you know, I belong to a different country in your, your analogy that you were given? Would you have actually donned the shirt? Would you have sung the national anthem? Ah, I see. Would I have sung the national anthem? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I kind of like the red rugby shirt. That's good. And uh, I like it when they sing <laughs> Bread of Heaven in the stadium. And the Welsh national anthem is quite wonderful, especially when 70,000 people are singing it. So I kind of like all of that. <laughs> Does that make me shallow? No, not at all. I think life is about compromise. There you uh, go. I'll throw one in here. Paul says in Romans 14, pay your taxes, which is a good thing to do. And we all yeah. do. We need roads. However... The taxation system in Rome at that time was totally unjust, totally unjust. Because? So many were not paying their taxes. Riots were on the street. About a year after Paul writes the Romans, stacks of people were rounded up and unjustly imprisoned and tortured. So I think Paul's statement is for us, yeah, pay your taxes, guys, go do it. But for them, it was pragmatic. It's not a battle to fight over. So I think there's a huge pragmatism. You belong to another country, get on with it, sing your national anthem or whatever, but what's in your heart is the issue. Yeah. You know, it's like for me, all war is civil war. Because? Israel, Gaza is civil war. Paul says it, we're all from one ancestor. The entire Okay, family. yeah. So we're all brothers and sisters by creation. Mm. One God. One family. So <laughs> you go to war, civil war. So for me, that's why I'm anti-war. But I also have to accept what do you do if a Hitler is on your doorstep? Now we come to compromise. Mm. But let's not say this is the right thing to do. It might be the only option we have left. And regrettably, the only thing we can do. But the whole idea, we're in the right. Yeah. Even for Joshua, and I, I do struggle with some of the scriptures on this point. But even Joshua, the scriptures record, God says, go in and wipe them out. He meets the Lord and he says, are you for them or for us? Wrong question. Mm. So in the midst of righteous war, God says wrong question. And so to me, it's, it's how do we have values that are from heaven, learn to live in a fallen world, and there'll be compromise. And one last thing, just to throw it in. How many people did Jesus say you must be born again to? Nicodemus was one. Was one. And the other one was, I can't remember who he was. Uh, Mrs. Trellis. Mrs. Trellis. Yeah. How many have the evangelists said it to? Oh, yeah, right. Who does he say it to? And Nicodemus. you, you're a teacher in Israel. You know the Bible beginning to end. You need to be born again. Hmm. And I'm happy to say, hey, everybody, this whole street needs to be born again. I'm happy to say that. But we take one verse out, which was spoken to one person, and we apply it to everybody. Hmm. Now, you know, if you want to box me, I'm an evangelical, but I also want to critique the tradition I come from. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've moved away from Christmas, Martin. You need to bail us out, but Noel's coming in again. No, no, no that, that's good. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to hinge what I was saying earlier on just that one thing i you know we are of a different kingdom martin aren't we whether it's yeah, being born totally. again or whatever but absolutely uh, yeah so anyway the first irishman in the bible oh was it nick odemus you got it in one go to the top of the class <laughs> and fall off as Mike milligan eloquently put it well i just say at the very beginning of this that you know we'll be having some thought-provoking thoughts mm. we're certainly doing that whilst obviously trying to talk about christmas as well but we could also look back on the past year and so what has really annoyed you, first of all, before we look at the positive side, what has really annoyed you about Christian behaviour this year, for instance? No, anything come to mind? What do you think? I think I touched on it in the last section. 
talking about how it seems that evangelicals have a certainty. And I think that is the curse mm. of evangelicalism, is that we are certain. And, you know, when world events happen, we have a scripture for those world events. Yeah. And we can, we can say, well, this has all been written several thousand yeah. years ago, and this is a fulfillment of these words. And I, I just hate that certainty, because I don't think, yeah. I think certainty is a curse. And it's the curse of the evangelicals. So when you hear people who you think are well known in Christian circles, in the media or whatever, and uh, they're asked, are you going to go to heaven? And they say, I hope so. Shouldn't they be more certain? <laughs> I'm just thinking before I put my foot in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think there's some things that we can be certain about <clears throat> or hopefully certain about. We can be certain about the fact that God loves us. Yeah. We can be certain about the fact that we live on this planet for a short amount of time. But there's so much that we don't know. But as often we yeah. come across with this overconfidence that we have to have an answer for everything. Mm. And I, sometimes I think we don't have an answer for everything. You know, stuff sure. happens. Uh, sure. But I think it's when we have this certainty that, yeah. for, for example, Israel is in the right and Palestinians yeah. are in the wrong, you know, just to give a black and white example. And, and I read an article again in an English newspaper by a very good writer called Matthew Syed. And, and he said that, you know, the problem in the Middle East is the certainty of religion. Yeah. That, you know, a whole bunch of people have been indoctrinated into this is what we believe. These people are evil. Therefore, we must destroy yeah. them. And I think that's yeah. a terrible thing. So, yeah, I would like a much more questioning faith. I don't know faith because our doubts help us to come to a realization of the truth like it thank you martin what do you think yeah i think along the same lines i think what i think your question is what disappointed me or what was really annoyed you what annoyed me i think it is the response to things like israel gaza or the ukraine war and when christians kind of plotted against like noel says the bible i mean i'm, I'm probably a little more out there than most of those but i i don't think the bible is any prediction about any of that at all personally and i, and I think it, it misses the point but i'm not trying to replace their certainty with mine i think for me it, it's then how are you going to live years ago i mean hark on about this but i had a guy in, in america back in the day of videotapes so you maybe had 12 of them i i knew the the speaker on them i could see the name and he said to me, Martin, you live in Europe. I'd love your comment on these tapes. Because I knew there was all about the rise of Antichrist and it would be the EU parliament and all of this. So I said to him, oh, man, I've not watched them, but so I've got a question for you. I said, what do you think I should do? Because I live in Europe. What should I do? Should I pray that all of this be fulfilled? And then be really happy. Look, the Bible said all this would happen. But probably I feel a little guilty about praying for the success of Antichrist. Probably. Or should I pray against it? And then feel guilty that I'm praying against what has been foreordained. I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you answer that and give me a clear answer. And then I can maybe watch the videos with you. Well, guess what? We never watched the videos. Mm -hmm. There's the trap. Yeah. There's nothing in scripture ever that is to leave us paralyzed, leave us questioning, dear God, what should be done with Israel, Gaza? One state, two states, da, 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 beyond me. What is God doing there? Beyond me. But I think the passivity of, I'm in the know, so I know what is happening, really. But, you know, and excuse the Greek, but I do read a little Greek, but I do damn all about it. And I use that advisedly because it's damn all. It's not from heaven. That kind of passivity that, that just makes not a scrap of difference is never from the heart of God. So even if all the theology is right, they've got to sort out their practice. So, so that, that's what gets to me. And I think given some of the war stuff this year, it, it has provoked me a lot. Can I add another little thing mm -hmm. to that as well? Because the list is growing. But um, <laughs> I, was, I was at an event in Croatia in the summer. Uh, it was fantastic. It was in a, an old kind of Roman Colosseum. It looked fantastic from the video. And it was just a lovely place to play. You know, I love doing these events because it's great when, you know, God's people come together 
and we have these high days and holy days. As I said to people, these events don't change the world, but they're good to do. That's why people go to concerts, you know, because we have a sense of being together. It's a collective thing. It's an encouraging thing. But uh, one of the artists, uh, I shouldn't really name this person because it's unfair, but one of the guys in the headline band uh, <laughs> during the evening just said, I, I just love what God's doing in Europe. And I thought, you're from the other side of the world. You haven't a clue what God's doing in Europe. <laughs> you're, you're going around doing a whole bunch of tours, playing to five, ten thousand 10,000 people. Yeah. But you really don't know what God's doing in Europe. And I don't think any of us really know what God is doing in Europe. Yeah. So, but we come out with these, these phrases when we're in these big yeah. public events. I love what God is doing here. God is on the move. Mm -hmm. I had a friend from Germany once, and I said to him, I said, Christoph, what do you think God's doing today? And he goes, he's making stuff. <laughs> and I said, why do you say that? He says, well, God's creative. So I guess he must be making stuff. <laughs> and it was one of the most profound answers to my question. We come up with all these grandiose statements, you know, like there's a yeah. revival happening in a certain part of America. So now rejoice, revivals come. But, yeah. you know, the world still goes on. And the people yeah. I know who are not in the Christian bubble, they are totally unaware of what God is doing in yeah, yeah, yeah. said country or in Europe for that matter. And do we really know what God is doing? Yeah. I don't think so. Thank you, Noel. Something you said a few minutes ago, Noel, actually, uh, which I can then pass on to, to Martin now. You said you were in a very insular, that's my word, growing up and the religiosity growing up. Mm. You said you couldn't go to pubs and things like that. And I've been trying desperately to remember what Martin said this time last year on the subject of alcohol. And you were in America, Martin. You were with a pastor. Okay. I was. You were driving along in his Ford Transit, whatever it was, and he almost drove off the road into the fields because you <laughs> stood your ground and you said, well, actually, I do drink alcohol. Yes, I did. But I can't remember what happened next. <laughs> what you said to prove your point. What was it? Yeah, a long drive from Dallas Airport to New Mexico. Mm, that's a long it's drive. not exciting. No. You run out of conversations, so I thought, right, that there's always one question in that context that will get a discussion going or, or get you thrown out of the car. And so I said, what's your attitude to alcohol? So he said, well, I preach against it. So I just made no response, baiting him. <laughs> he looks three or four times <laughs> at me. He says, what about you, brother? And uh, so I said, well, I, I drink it. At which point he all but swerved, <laughs> jerk on the steering wheel as we no other cars on the freeway, but we we would have hit a couple had there been ones. And then he said to me, but he said the wine in the New Testament was non-alcoholic. Give me a break. So I said, wow, that's a new revelation to me. So when Paul said, do not get drunk on non-alcoholic wine, that's a fairly strong command. <laughs> and he then said to me, you have just ruined my sermon. I said, well, maybe, maybe get another one. <laughs> Thank you. I had a little humor and he had a heart attack. <laughs> I do appreciate, you know, the, there are families with alcohol yes. abuse and, and there are huge abuses, of course. Yeah. And, and the scripture is clear. Do not get drunk yeah. on wine or beer or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It has to be nuanced. But to, to have a blanket statement, no Christian can drink. Maybe, maybe if we're in a culture with a real issue and a problem, for the sake of the gospel, you say, I am not going to touch anything. Mm. But to make a blanket statement, alcohol is evil. Well, we've got a bit of a problem. When Jesus turned the water into wine, which in my Bible says is the first miracle, and here he revealed his glory for the first time. Exactly. This might be a little bit of a shock, but the same verb that Paul uses, do not get drunk, is the verb used to the people. When the people were now well drunk, they came and said, we've got no more wine. And Mary says to Jesus, go get the water. So he was not against people having a good time. And uh, maybe, well, not maybe, I think obviously a, a lot in that party, that wedding party, had had too much to drink. Mm. Jesus didn't seem to consider it the biggest error they were making. And if I'm going to take the Bible literally at this point, Martin, which might be an error... <laughs> At some point, Bible, you want to. <laughs> yeah, the Bible does say that, that Jesus provided 140 gallons yeah, a lot of, wine. of wonderful wine. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which brings a whole new meaning to bring a bottle. <laughs> he brought a liquor store. He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. It comes back to the C word. I think this is, you know, looking back on this now, the word for this podcast is compromise. Okay. You don't have to go and get yeah. drunk, but you can have a couple of glasses of wine. Sure. Or you could wait yeah. till you get home to have a glass of wine rather than going to the pub driving. Yeah. Wait till you get home. Compromise. Come on. Yeah. And, you know, on, if you've never had Christmas cake with cheddar cheese or Stilton and a little glass of port, you've missed out on something. There's some things that go together. Like I said at the beginning, pasta and red wine. We did. As we decorated our little tree yesterday, our little 18-inch high tw- tree. <laughs> the elf on the shelf. I said, Trish, we must have a little glass of sherry with that. <laughs> And she said, just the one, just the but one. There you go, you did. Oh, come on. I felt very Christmassy. Let's continue it then. Right. Because what has encouraged you about coming up towards Christmas or the whole year? Let's be positive. What's encouraged you about Christianity this year, Noel and Martin? I'll give you one little thing, Christmas and encouragement. Sunday, a guy's going to come around here and cook us some pre-Christmas, but Christmas meal. And he has a background where alcohol was a problem, but he is just a wonderful servant, works part-time, dedicates the rest of his time uh, to helping people, come around here to cook us a meal, and he's got his heart set on being a chaplain in the army. Wow. Stories like that, for me, are like, they're, they're amazing, you know, because they're individual stories. This person's life, there's a before and an after. There's a struggle throughout, but there's a presence of Christ right in the middle of it. Peace on earth, goodwill to this guy Mm. and uh, he's going to give you something to eat that you will love and enjoy because he's a great cook so it's kind of got me all all the elements christmas conversion call it born again Mm -hmm. struggle we talked about alcohol he's got a background in that so we won't be drinking you know it's got all the elements there he's got a future direction for me that that is it that multiplied many times over is what we're looking for no, what's excited you this year about Christianity? I can't actually give a specific example, just like Martin did. But what I love reading is the obituaries in the Times newspaper. <laughs> and particularly some of those obituaries, really, you do find them very inspiring. Yeah. I read one by, he died, obviously he's died because he's in the obituary. <laughs> but he was one of the major influences behind the early charismatic movement in the UK. And it was a name I'd never heard of, but he mentored the likes of Sandy Miller at Holy Trinity Brompton, uh, which then later went on to mm. be quite an influential church in London. But he was a behind-the-scenes guy. I just thought, what, what was a his wonderful... name? No. Do you know, I, I, I wrote it uh, down because worry. I was, I was going to do a, a little podcast about mentoring because I felt this was a guy who I'd never heard of. You know, and I've, I've been around evangelicals all my life and been around a lot of evangelical leaders in the UK in my time. I'd never, ever heard of this guy. And yet he was a behind-the-scenes guy who just quietly got on and served God, and he was a mentor to so many. And I just think I love, I love those stories of yeah. people who basically just go on and do stuff that maybe nobody will ever know about. Yeah, that's awesome. And to me, that, yeah. that was inspiring. I thought, yeah, we just need to be, just to be more like that and, to, and take those opportunities to encourage somebody along the line because we never know uh, yeah, what will happen to those people that we meet and encounter along the way. For me, it was just a lesson learned. Always encourage, always build people up, always help people to believe in the gifts that they have because who knows what might happen. Well, as you know, on the podcast, every guest, the final question for them is to tell us who their Christian hero is and they have to be dead and not in the Bible. Every so often we get the ones that no one has heard of, which is great to fly the flag. And one of the stories recently was about how they were going in their church and going out into the area. And this was in Scotland. And they were looking after people who were on drugs. Mm-hmm. And for the first year, nothing happened. So a trickle came through and it got bigger and bigger. Eventually, they got the Queen's Award for Voluntary Services, which was great. Oh, but come on. his Christian hero, he said, are those people that go out and do it? Mm. And I said, no, 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 you've got to be more specific. He said, OK, Tracy. And it turned out Tracy was a little old lady who didn't come to Christ until in her late 60s or whatever. She would faithfully go and open the church every day to let people come in if they wanted to come in. She would sit in the corner and people would go and treat her like a mother hen, really, eventually go and speak to her and stuff. But what's fascinating, it was this little lady, it was her idea to do this. Mm -hmm. And it took her into her late 60s to A, become a Christian, and then B, to go to a church, and then C, 
for that minister to hear what she was saying and run with it. Brilliant. And the result of it was was that you know the church has received all this accolade. Yeah, and it was great to hear as well because the minister didn't go down to Buckingham Palace to collect it because he just felt it was a facilitator. Mm. Yeah, I think that's my story of the year as well. Come on. It's been great as usual to have all these chin wags. That just really comes down to two more questions. So here we go then. In these days, this is again from Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. I mean, she really has been busy. Yeah, she's a busy woman. Isn't she? She obviously hasn't got anything else to do. Uh, <laughs> in these days, we hear a lot about younger people being manipulated by older, powerful people, especially in areas of grooming and sexual abuse. How does the nice and cosy The Christmas Narrative sound in today's Me Too world? Mm. Is it not the story of a powerful male authority figure making a young girl pregnant? How do we square up to the Bible account within our current culture? Does the whole Christmas story have a whiff of abuse? Thank you, Mrs. Trellis, again for that. Martin, you can kick us off. What do you think? Oh, thank you. All right, let, let's hit this one head on. We might have to tell the story a little sharper in our culture because of what Mrs. Trellis has brought up. But it's got nothing to do with a male God. It's got everything to do with a female God, Goddess. Mm. Keep going. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. In other words, what is presented is there are two wombs. Jesus is born or conceived, nurtured, grows, develops inside what? The womb of Mary and the womb of the Holy Spirit. A little aside, Europe. Uh, as a continent, what's the myth of Europe? The myth of Europe is that Zeus, the main male god, seduced a Phoenician princess and had sex with her. Result, Europa. Europe is produced. And I think people kind of think that maybe is what's going on in the New Testament. There is nothing close to a male God being not being crude here, having sex with a young woman. It's got everything to do with a young woman participating with a nurturing God. Hence, I talk a little cheekily uh, about a female God. Mm -hmm. Because God is not male. That's why sometimes I, I talk she, he. Because... It's no more right to say she and female than it is to say he and male. Mm -hmm. You understand? They're both wrong. Yeah. God is neither male <laughs> nor female. He's beyond that. Yeah. But it is certainly not some crude picture. And I think it's all to do with a young woman. And blessed you will be, uh, Virgin Mary. You'll be spoken of highly from now on. Submitting in partnership with a God that is like Mary, or Mary is like God, if I put it that way, a God who submits, a God who humbles him herself and, and cooperates. But, but I think probably we need to try to find fresh ways of telling the story, because I think instantly you tell it, either we don't think about it, or if people were to think about it, it's, oh my, this is terrible. Young 12, 13-year-old woman, overpowering male God. Our problem is with our male God image. Mm. If we could change that, we can begin to change the story. I would say at one level, I'm the, it's not a female God, the Holy Spirit, but it's far more of the feminine there than it is the masculine. I grew up with all these cozy stories about God and what he did Yeah, using just the language that I grew up with there, Martin. Sure. Because we always saw God as the Father, God as he. So we had these incredible stories of the Old Testament, you know, yeah. where God slays all the firstborn. And yeah. now we've got a little song about that, haven't we? So let's sing a little <laughs> action chorus about that. And the whole of my Sunday school education was about these horrific things that took place yeah. in the Old Testament. But isn't it wonderful that God killed every living human being and just saved Noah and his family? We've got a song yeah. about that. Yeah. And so we sing about the, the drowning of hundreds of thousands or yeah. maybe more and and now that god who did that he loves <coughs> you so much and he wants you to yeah. give your life to him and so uh, i can understand where mrs trellis is coming from it's the way that the story is being told and yeah. i think we have to in the 21st century find new ways of communicating yeah, for sure that narrative because i think the cozy image of lots of things that we that i particularly grew up with, I think, needs to be mm. handled differently mm. in this present culture in which we live. Just to bail you out, Martin, if that's OK, so we don't get inundated with another letter. Regarding your statement about God might be male or female, that reference you made right at the beginning, and I think you were trying to do a David Pawson, really, there, just to stir up the pot and see what happens. I'll give you a couple of minutes to dig yourself out so that I don't get a letter. 
<laughs> Digging yet deeper. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, the, the Bible is full of, of male language. It, it is throughout it. But I think what we mustn't do is move from the male language to assume, therefore, that God is male. I think scripture is completely, it, it blows that apart. Maybe as a corrective, and I do, I often write S slash he when I, when I refer to God. But it's not because I think God is she, but I want to challenge the thought, well, do you think that God is masculine made in your image? That's what, you know, Caesar was. What, why is he a son of God? Because he rules like God does. Masculine, strong. We bring peace. How do we bring it? Well, you didn't submit to us. So we killed half your tribe. Now you submit. And that's how most people think about God. So, for example, Philippians 2, I will quote best I can, something like the NIV, most modern translations. Jesus, although in the form of God, humbled himself and became obedient, obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. There is no word although in the text, but translators put it in. So let me translate it as is. Jesus, being in the form of God, humbled himself. It's as, it's as straightforward as Lionel Messi, being a great penalty taker, took the final penalty. Mm. Why did he do it? Because that's who he is. Mm -hmm. Why did Jesus humble himself? Because this is God, not in spite of being God. <laughs> and then we end up with all the problems. We have a God who is masculine, austere, and a Jesus who bails us out. Well, when I say the most common view in the atonement, it is not the most historic view that God turned his face from Jesus, couldn't look on sin and punished Jesus. I don't find that in the, in, in the scripture because it sets up a, a divide between God and Jesus. Mm. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So I, I do want to push the, the boundaries because we must not end up creating God in our image, my image, your image our image, masculine image, which is what's dominated. We are in God's image. He's, he, she is not in ours. And I use he, she, because God is not he nor she, but we got to use some kind of pronoun. And, and to switch from he to she might be provocative, but it isn't accurate. Hmm. But I would also say neither is he accurate. And, and then, you know, terms like spirit, ruach in Hebrew is a feminine term. I'm not a great Hebrew person, to be honest, but from my memory, I think that the womb is something like rechem or, or compassion is, I can't remember, but it's from the same root. And I know you had, uh, I can't remember who, but podcasting about the feminine in scripture. Yes, yes. Uh, with you, Martin. Yes. Yeah, and I, I listened to that. Uh, and we have to have that as a corrective because otherwise we are going to be in God's image and I'll push the boat out there and and therefore Trump becomes a very easy person to vote for because he's quite like God. Hmm. Whereas my Bible says, listen to what comes out of a person's mouth. You find what's in their heart. We, we lose our critical ability because you can't talk like that hmm. with that's a true. heart that is yielded to God. You know, so I'm not saying he, he's a bad or a good person. That's, that's beside the point. But we somehow think he is God's appointed person because he's quite like God. Rubbish. Absolute balderdash. And the challenge is, Martin, how like God are you? Or are you just creating a God in your own image that suits you? And then you can get away with all kinds of behavior, dominating. You know, and, and that to me, going back to the Caesar thing is, that is the rule of Caesar. You know, I don't, obviously I could push it a lot further, you know, that, uh, yeah. I think yeah. there's whole areas that we need to explore and reread. And I think scripture invites us into that. I, I can't work out. The scriptures that Noel quoted, go kill all these people. Yeah. I believe scripture. I, I'm happy to use the term word of God and qualify it. I can't work out why it's in there. But what I do know is scripture invites me in because if I put it this way, it doesn't always agree with itself. Yeah. Because the real issue is, Martin, what do you think? How are you going to live? Yes. And you, I think, you know, so it's like conflicts. And I think when we, we have a certain concept of who God is, yeah, the strength of God or whatever, misguidedly you know i think there's a, a a theology that is pretty prevalent which is called the seven mountains yeah which is it's horrific because it's basically a christian version of the taliban yeah because they want to dominate culture and society in the way that the taliban want to dominate in afghanistan yeah and so it's like if we can create a christian america and also other countries of the world 
where basically Christian laws are in effect, where Christian morality is imposed, we can usher in the return of Christ, yeah. which seems to be nuts. And of course, very selective on what is Christian morality. Of course, yes. Certain types of sexual behavior, which we all yes, agree on. Exactly. Uh, but anger? Mm -hmm. I don't want that one on the statute books, but there's a Christian value. Don't be angry. Yeah. Oh, exactly. we're going to imprison you. You were angry this morning. <laughs> yeah. Hang on a minute. I don't like that Christian <laughs> law. I've been life imprisonment, me. Yes. Give, give, away, give away all you have to the poor. Oh, I, 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 yeah, Jesus said that to one person. The same yeah. as he said, be born again to one person. Which laws are we going to choose? <laughs> Noel will be fine because he'll be doing all these praise and worship gigs throughout the whole of America. He'd be fine with his bank balance, uh, sure. Yeah, he'd have a big mountain. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're going to have a, a really big tree next year, no? Just think yeah, of a it. big tree, wouldn't I? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you put a big Christmas tree and a yeah, big house to come put on, it in. Yeah. I could Something lay up to look good, forward to. I could really lay up some treasure on earth, couldn't I? Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd be right. well away, mate. Mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so there you go. We're giving you lots of ideas Thank for you. future podcasts there. Well, I was also thinking, this is a serious question because you were talking about, we could sing a song about that, couldn't we? You know, in your best Blue Peter voice. <laughs> but when was the last time you wrote a, a slightly cynical, sarcastic chorus, let's say? <laughs> and if not, when are you going to do one? Um, well, I, I, I hope I'm not a cynic. You know, I, I don't want to write a cynical song. I think we need to write provocative songs. Ma Martin, actually, we can talk like this because we've been friends for so many years. And uh, I love it when we talk, there's nothing that's off the table, you know, so we can sit around the table like this for hours and talk about issues, <laughs> the real issues, you know, yeah. and we provoke one another. And I, I certainly have been provoked. But I think, you know, Martin said, you know, why, why not write worship songs for the world? Yeah. For me, one of the most moving things this summer was, was seeing, I don't know, maybe over 100,000 people at Glastonbury singing Morning is Broken with Cat Stevens wow. leading it. Yeah. it. That just reduced me to tears because I thought here's a hundred thousand people at a music festival who maybe don't know God, yeah. but they're connecting with the God of creation and they're singing a song about the God of creation. And I just thought, ah, oh, that to me was a little taste of heaven uh, in the midst of this amazing, yeah. one of the biggest music festivals in the world, that there was a spirit of worship there. To me, that's where, if we're wanting to write worship songs, let's write the hymns that the world sings. Mm -hmm. And mm. uh, that if I've got any ambition, it's just to mm. write something that maybe will resonate with people who are outside of the Christian culture, that will <coughs> help them to engage yeah. with a God who loves them. Brilliant. I doubt if 100,000 people sang along to Cat Stevens' greatest song of all time, which is Matthew and Son. Yeah. Oh, is it Father to Son? Matthew and Son. It's Matthew called. and Son. The word's never done. But then there's the other one where he's talking about passing on wisdom to his son. It was a big hit for somebody else. Was it Take That? I don't know. I wonder uh, no, yeah, it was the Irish band. Yeah. Yeah, that was first used in a comedy program, Just Good Friends, when Vince yeah. thought he could try and impress and he used the lyrics from that. Bonus question. Mm. Here is your bonus question. Who played piano on Morning Is Broken for the single? Buzz. Piz. Noel Richards. Rick Wakeman. Correct, he did. And Rick finally got his payment for it only a few years ago. <laughs> well done, Noel. Well, final question, and also from Mrs. Trellis, and this is just to sum it all up, I think, because we are here for a Christmas uh, edition, and it's only fair, having provoked, having thought, having discussed, having had our brains stretched, just have a bit of fun at the very end as well. And can I just say, for those of you who've been really challenged by this, don't write to me, write to Martin Scott. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> no, yeah, no right. uh, da, 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 yeah, com. yeah, yeah. You mentioned earlier on, Martin, about the podcast with Jeannie Kendall yeah. about women in the gospel. And we are, our lawyers have talked to her lawyers. We've now got the contract signed. We're going to be doing a sequel in February. Oh, sweet. About Paul and what did Paul say? Because, yeah. like you've alluded, I think, Things can be taken out of context. For sure. That's to come. If you want to know more, because for me, one of the, the highlights for me, that episode that went out with Jeannie Keynes, I was expecting loads of letters or whatever, or really good friends of mine to phone up and say, Martin, that shouldn't have been played. This is, you know, this is wrong. And it was quite the reverse, actually. I was really, really impressed that the people I thought who would have a problem actually sat down and listened to it. Oh, good. I thought that was great. So for those that listen today, if you want to question it, then fine. Go on to our website, www.offgridchristianity.co.uk to find uh, the email address and email us. And I'm sure I can pass it on to Martin's lawyers who can then pass it on to Martin. <laughs> 
So the final question then from Mrs. Trellis again, and this is just for a bit of a laugh to say thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. If you were a traffic sign, what would you be and why? And it's a question that I can join in as well at the end if anyone bothers to ask me. Let's go Martin first. If you were a traffic sign, what would you be and why, please? I'd want to be a roundabout sign because there's a bit of give and take. You've got to let other people who are on the roundabout give them space. It keeps traffic moving. The flow is, is determined by us, the drivers. You know, if a whole bunch of cars coming from the right, because the traffic is heavier there, then traffic to the left has to wait. I like that kind of a give and take. We're talking more seriously, I think, give and take here. Here's my idea, or well, there's yours. Let me listen. I'll pause while you're on the roundabout. Oh, I'm on it now. Will you shut up and listen to me? I'd be a roundabout or a, a sign saying roundabout about to come. No, what would you be? I've had time to think while Martin was waxing lyrical about something <laughs> with meaning. So I would like to be a German street sign ah. because I have a perverse sense of humour. I would be a German street sign and I would say Einbahnstrasse. Strasse is street. Yep. Bahn and, is uh, station. Uh, well, actually, Einbahnstrasse is one-way street. Oh, okay. Right. Yes, because then when all the English soccer fans come across <laughs> to support their team on an away game and go into the bars and drink an awful lot mm -hmm. and think oh, we can't drive back to our hotel because we've drunk too many German beers. So we will park in the street. We'll leave our oh, car in Einbahnstrasse and the next morning we'll pick it up. And so the next morning they go to the receptionist at the hotel and they say, we left our car in the street in the city of Berlin. Can you tell us how to get to Einbahnstrasse? And she'll go, which Einbahnstrasse do you mean? Because there are so many one-way streets in Berlin. Ah, well. Thank you. Ah, oh, very deep. How's that? Thank now, you. Martin, being a, you being a football fan, mm. he had a bit of a dig at football there, didn't he? <laughs> well. Very stereotypical. So, come on, your turn. I can actually go one better than that. 1982, my first ever World Cup. I was 21, and the only way you could get football tickets to go and watch England, because, you know, England were apparently a bit naughty off the terraces in those days. So they came up with this great idea that you could only go to watch England if you bought a package holiday, which we did. And I thought I'd hire a car and drive all the way down to Zaragoza. Very good. Zaragoza. Yeah. See, I'm almost bilingual here. And we drove all the way down to watch Northern Ireland play yeah. Yugoslavia. And it was Neil Neil. And Norman Whiteside, I believe, made his debut. Oh, Norman Whiteside. 17 years. We hired this Fiat car and I drove 250 miles there and drove 250 miles back to San Sebastian, where we were staying. And what a beautiful place San Sebastian is. Loved it. Mm, it is. Yeah. Right on the north coast. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning, driving to the, the city centre right by the beach, knowing that we just had to go up the hill to the campsite. I was driving down this road, and all of a sudden this big army Land Rover type thing with you know four Spanish army people in there, flashing lights, pulling me over. And I suddenly realised I was driving down a one-way street the wrong way. The wrong mm, way. The wrong and way. Two o'clock in the morning. And the thing was, they came up and knocked on the door and I sort of got out. Uh, I said, whatever the Spanish for parlez vous anglais is. <laughs> it's not that. And here's the funny thing. Because we'd gone with this company, they gave us a little credit card slip, laminated, yeah. which says that we were genuine football fans representing the country England on behalf of such and such, such and such. I gave it to him. And he looked at it and he burst out laughing and they let us off. Nice one, mate. Very good. A traffic sign. Who are you? What traffic sign are you? I am going to be a disabled traffic sign. Because as you know, my oh. wife is seriously not well and disabled. Oh, come on. So I would be a disabled traffic sign, especially in the parking areas. Yeah. But actually, I'm going to go one further. I am going to be an automated traffic sign with a machine gun attached to it. So that if anyone parks in a disabled bay, yeah. I'm only going to be here for a minute because, you know, I've got to go to the shop because I'm very important. I've got to go and get this. Oh, I'm only going to go for a minute to the shops. But my wife, who's disabled, she can sit in the car because there's a badge. Sorry, I'll just shoot you. End of. Okay. Well, happy Christmas. <laughs> 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 yeah. I Legally, I don't know if that would get through the courts or not with my machine gun. I don't know, mate. Can you hear my angst on it? I, I, I hear Mr. Angry from Tunbridge Wells is on the phone right now. Yeah, I, and I'm going to park in the one-way street. I'm going yes. to avoid it. Yes. No, thank you so much for joining us. 
yet again for this Christmas edition. Martin, thank you so much for joining us again this Christmas edition. Thank you. A pleasure. Well, and for everyone that's listening, thank you so much. And then we hope we've uh, ticked all the right boxes and to make your Christmas just a bit more cheerful. If you're feeling like really fed up and down. and Yeah. Brilliant. Would you like a parting word to say on that, Martin? I hope it's been a little encouraging a little provocative a lot of fun and have a great christmas everybody no yeah and a wonderful new year a wonderful new year we'll speak to you very soon indeed thank you so much cheers